Hello everyone, my name is Name, and I work with Kivera. I'm one of the office people, so your registration probably funneled through my fingertips in the typing capacity. Welcome. This next speaker is a badass. <laughs> She's an agroecologist, systems thinker, and educator. She has a formal background in ecology, soil science, and organizational learning. She has provi been providing agricultural consulting and extension services since 2003. Her client base covers over, any guesses? One million acres. It's a lot, yeah? Her client base is in US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Everyone prepare yourself. This is gonna be fun. Please help me welcome Nicole Masters. Can you hear me? Yeah? I have a confession to make. Um, I used to be an addict. Or rather, my microbes used to be addicts. One of the things that uh, can form in your body when you're allergic to milk is a Casio morphine. It has a very similar chemical structure to actually morphine. So I used to enjoy milk because it would make me feel relaxed. A little bit foggy brained, actually. Um, and it would also give me headaches. So when I finally realized that I had this allergy, I stopped drinking milk. And I did what I tell my <laughs> clients not to do. I went cold turkey and I pulled the milk out of my diet, all dairy products. Um, what then happened was a catastrophic crash. So uh, I was pretty sick for about 10 days as you go through the morphine withdrawal process. Yeah, so what I'm here to talk about is looking at gut microbiology and thinking it, about it in terms of planetary gut health. So if you, some of you probably know a lot about human nutrition, and if we think about the human body, for every one of your human cells, you have 10 microbial cells. If you look at just your genes, you have 23,000 human genes to between 3 to 20 million microbial cells. So you're more of a microbe than you are a human being. So basically, I think about this when I'm reaching for chocolate. It's not me. I'm not responsible. <laughs> for those of you that like late night carbohydrates or beer, not you. You're not responsible, all right? So our microbes actually dictate how we feel, how we um, wake up in the morning, many of the things that drive us. So they're actually driving you to go out and do things. It's kind of interesting when you think about it. So for a lot of the research that we're looking at at the moment, in terms of um, consciousness science or microbiology or astrophysics, any of this stuff, they, they talk about it in terms of we're looking out into the void. You can hardly see that. That's kind of what it's like looking at science at the moment. We're basically standing on the edge of the void and looking out. What is microbiology doing? What's it doing in our bodies? What is happening in soil? How does that relate to animal health and pasture health? So if you look in the research at just the keywords uh, microbiome, you'll see that the interest in microbiology has just gone through the roof in the last 10 years. This stuff really is cutting edge. So you, if you feel like no one's been talking about microbiology, it is quite a new um, research. And that, that's where the exciting stuff is. So when I did soil science in 1999, no one mentioned that it was alive. You know, there's these soils. We have this manual that we learn about soil science in New Zealand, it's about this big, four pages on microbiology. It's still the textbook that they're using in universities, unfortunately. So we need these gut microbes, right? So you'll eat an apple, you chew it away, you make it smaller, it passes through that gastrointestinal system, and in there is all this microbiology. So you guys could have between three to six pounds of microbes in your gut, and they're processing your food so that you can grow, they can regulate your health, they're providing vitamins and enzymes, helping your whole body to function, and the disruption of this gut flora is what's key to diseases. And what's quite interesting is they're now linking pretty much everything to your gut microbiome. So acne, asthma, allergies, anxiety, PTSD, arthritis, autism, autoimmune cancers, Crohn's, depression, diabetes, eczema, inflammation, longevity, motor neuron, motor <laughs> MS, obesity, Parkinson's, 
sleep issues, tooth cavities, weight gain, and more. Has anyone in the room not had one of those experiences? <laughs> the human gut microbiome in the US has crashed and burned. Um, I know for myself, I was a little bit anxious about speaking to you guys, and my microbiome has gone a little bit whoop. I won't talk about that, that's fine. <laughs> All right, so what interested me when you come to the States is you guys have entire aisles. An aisle on pharmaceuticals, half of it's dedicated to things to make you poop, and the other half is to stop you pooping. <laughs> we don't have that in New Zealand, right? So if you think about all of those different ailments, it's all related to your gut, how you feel, right? What you wake up with. You think about so many of these things are linked to our human gut microbiome. It's no wonder the country's in the state it is. I'm not saying your country's in any state at any <laughs> All right, so uh, we've blown, <laughs> sorry, I'll take that back. Uh, we've blown this microbial bridge, right? And we're doing the same thing in our soils. So our soils have indigestion, constipation, gas, and if you go to New Zealand, rampant diarrhea. All right? So <laughs> you want to start looking at what is happening with my soil gut system. And for a lot of your ranches, your landscapes are either constipated or they're totally asleep. Right? They've just fallen asleep. So the US loses about 6.9 billion tons of soil each year. It's your biggest export by far. So that's on average about three tons per acre that you're losing. So that means on some of these operations, you could be losing 20 tons. And hopefully for some of you guys, you're actually building this soil and that's what we want to see. But there's something serious going on here in the US and it's not really being talked about. So there's microbes everywhere. So uh, that picture on the left is flying into San Francisco, so those are those big salt things, right? There's different types of bacteria in there. You're gonna find them up in the most extreme environments, at the top of Mount Everest, at the bottom of deep sea channels, uh, everywhere, right? So including hands. So what I'd like you to do is reach the person next to you, and hopefully you can do this, I'd like you to shake hands. I want you to hold on, don't let go. Don't let go. Right, we're gonna time you. Now hold on, so the person on the left, your job is to hold on. The person on the right, your job is to get out. We're gonna see how fast can you do it. On your marks, get set, go and put your hand up when you've done it. Oh, wow. Oh. There are some tough women in this room, cowboys. You should be ashamed. Woo! <laughs> All right, now I want you to do it again, but switch. So the other person who was holding on, you're now the one who's got to get going. So hold on. Now wait. I've got a simple instruction. Ask them to let go of your hand. All right, do that. Shake hands. Say, let go, please. Put your hand up when you're done. <sighs> Very good. Did you... <laughs> Please, did, did she ask nicely? You just, yeah, all right. So for many of us, this is actually how we operate as human beings, that we see land that we're gonna tell it what to do, that we're gonna make it fit our will instead of these basic, what is that land asking you to do? How do we communicate? And this is how biology works, is they're communicating all of the time and it's much more energy efficient, yeah, and no one pulls any muscles, all right. So I want you to think about a disturbed soil. So in a disturbed soil, what would make a soil disturbed? You can't say your wife. What would make a soil disturbed? Cultivation, Cultivation. good. The cowboy way? Chemicals. <laughs> Sorry? Chemicals. Chemicals will do it, yeah. Uh, water logging will do it, a fire will do it. But so imagine you've disturbed that soil. You can take those species down to about 5,000 species in a teaspoon. So there's still a lot of biology in there, all right? But what you'll find is often it's your disease organisms, your pathogens, your root feeders. Uh, oh, sorry, that's in New Zealand. You're going to have to convert. So it's the equivalent of about one jersey steer per hectare. So you're going to have to chop that jersey steer up to make it an acre, I'm sorry. <laughs> but if, I want you to imagine that when you look out your window or when you're driving around, there's actually a biomass of biology underneath the ground that is larger than the biomass above the ground. 
All right? So if we're not disturbing soil, if we're actually regenerating and building life, you could have the equivalent of 25,000 species in that teaspoon. Right? And it's the equivalent of five Angus bulls per hectare. So when you look out across that land, you've got all of that biomass under there. And they're essential because they're providing these services that we're talking about. Resilience, a buffer to temperature, a buffer to water, nutrients. We want to see that diversity in there so that you can respond quickly and adapt. So if we can play this video, hopefully it just goes. Oil. It cannot hunt for food elsewhere or move out of harm's way. What a plant can do is release hormones and other chemical signals. Certain kinds of soil bacteria sense these signals and travel to the plant's root. Once there, they may live on the root surface or they may enter and live inside the root. Some of these bacteria feed the plant by collecting and digesting mineral nutrients from the soil. Other bacteria defend the plant from disease-causing organisms and viruses. Bacteria have even been found to protect the plant from drought by coating the root with a sticky goo called biofilm. Scientists are studying how these bacteria can be used strategically to produce healthier crops. So um, what I find interesting about that, so I support what they're talking about, except the last bit at the end, which is we're going to find the species. We've got the silver bullet. So you notice that Bayer at the moment have a bacillus. It's a single input. We're going to save the world, all right, with these single inputs. However, it's not. It's diversity. It's getting a range of species out there and supported through our management. So there's thousands of these signaling molecules that plants are basically sending out all of the time. So these plants can't move. They can't go down to the local supermarket. What do you call it? I, what other supermarkets here? IGA? Smith's. Smith's. All right. Albertsons. All right. So they can't just go down there and get food that they need. They need to bring the food to them. So they're sending out thousands of these molecules. So these proteins and hormones and enzymes and elicitors that switch functions on and switch functions off. They're also important for plant defense molecules. So it's really interesting to me is that the plant can't actually make a lot of these molecules by themselves. They send out a signal, certain types of bacteria respond, and now they induce these responses in the plant so that they can actually defend themselves. So in the 1960s, they were looking at what caused uh, squid to fluorescence, right? And they found it was bacteria and that they were signaling to each other. So they called this quorum signaling. So it's turning biology on and turning biology off. So they discover that ants and honeybees use this, and we're seeing this in plants and microbes. They, they think that this is going to replace modern antibiotics. If you can figure out the chemical signal, for instance, you could have strep, the strep organisms in your throat, but you're not virulent. Then suddenly the signal goes on, now you've got a sore throat. Well, they figured out if you can get that chemical signal, you can turn strep throat off. So instead of antibiotics, which just, we're just going to kill everything, they can be very, very specific. So they developed one for cholera, and I don't know when it's going to be released, but it has been developed that you can drink this chemical signal and it tells the cholera to evacuate, which is pretty exciting. But this is explaining a lot of the things that we're seeing in terms of soil health and resilience. It's parts per trillion so we're often working with, I, I'm totally in love with worms, I just wanted to clear that. Um, <laughs> so we're putting on as much as a half a gallon of a worm extract and seeing phenomenal responses with soil, plant health and animal performance from half a gallon. It's due to this process, we're turning things on. So this for instance, is this click a thingy light? No. No. Ooh. All right, the light's not working, but if you can imagine on the left-hand side, this would be a plant that doesn't have a relationship with this case, it's trichoderma, which is a type of fungus. So on the left, we have diseases. On the right, with the presence of trichoderma, we get this enhanced defense. So that plant sends a signal, the trichoderma responses, and the hormones are primed. So it starts to produce jasmonic, ethylene, salicylic acid, abscisic acid, and prosystamine. The plant can't do it by itself. If you're in a disturbed soil on the left, we now have plants that are vulnerable to insect pests, disease, 
and stress. The plants on the left are what we call droughty. All right? So we want to look at how do we optimize that biological diversity and that biomass, and it's absolutely critical because your plant health, nutrition, animal weight gains, milk production, all of it is driven by these plant signals. So what we found is the more communities, the more diversity, then the more gene expression, which means increased crop health and resilience. But it's without this community, those microorganisms can't express their full genetic potential. They just sit there hanging out by themselves. When they get different buddies coming in, so this would be bacteria and fungi, we start to see gene expression. So how can we optimize this process in ranching? One of my processes looks at what is putting a drag on your system. So you guys are probably some of the best managers in the world. Is management putting a drag on your system? Possibly not. So we start to look at what else could be putting a drag on you achieving your goals. It could be your minerals, your microbes, your mindset. Gosh forbid that it would be your mindset. If you're not sure if it's your mindset or not, <laughs> ask your husband. He's pretty clear about your mindset, or she. Um, or is it organic matter? So I call these the five M's. Well, um, well OM, it counts as an M. Um, is the five M's, is what is putting this drag on the system? So mindset, for instance, is you starting to think, um, I've got all the answers, I'm good now. Or um, what else would be a mindset? Just feeling like there's nothing else would be possible, that this is it. I can't make any other changes. I haven't got the time. I haven't got the money. Oh, that darn climate change. That things are outside of you. Whereas actually, what we're looking at when we're looking at land is a fingerprint of you, which sometimes is a bit confronting, right? Huh. Okay. So when we think about carbon, and there's some very... There's some of the experts in the world are in the room right now, so I don't want to go too deep into it. But So carbon is the planet's currency. It what makes things go around. It's why you run your machinery on fossil fuels. It's stored energy. How do we prime the battery that's in your soil and get it functioning? So how do we get carbon into the soil? How would you guys get carbon in the soil? How are you doing it right now? Grazing, okay, so we're just grazing, what are you doing with that grazing? You're gonna like trample it? Yeah, what else? How else can we get carbon in the soil? Yeah? Increase plant growth. Increase the amount of plant growth above ground, which hopefully is gonna increase the amount of root material underneath. What else are you doing? Let the weeds grow. Let, the, let weeds grow, yep, cool. Those pictures aren't really turning out like I want them to. So, uh, what else? Compost. compost. So, some people are actually putting solid compost applications out or uh, those compost extracts. Is it from having cover crops? You see, cover crops are really taking off, right? Is it introducing that kind of root material? Is, is that the main way that we get deep, stable carbon? Hands up if you think that's the way that we get carbon in the soil. Hands up if you think that's not how you get carbon in the soil. <laughs> All right, so back there, how do we get carbon in the soil? Liquid the liquid carbon pathway, very good. All right, so <laughs> you've been looking at my slides. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so the liquid carbon pathway was termed by Dr. Christine Jones, but it is this process whereby we get um, sugars, being taken up through the process of photosynthesis, being sent out the root zone, out your mycorrhizae, and deep into soil. You need to be looking at how do we harness this, because this is the key if you're interested in, in building carbon in the environment. So that top cycle, the one I call, one, I'm here for a good time, not a long time, honey, cycle, uh, is very important. So what you're doing in terms of trampling organic material, that's what really fuels that plant in terms of photosynthesis. So we often think of photosynthesis like, the, you know, CO2 is coming into the plant. It's not coming from the atmosphere. Most of it's coming from below ground as the plants, or sorry, as the soil breathes out and breathes in every day. There's this massive cycle of carbon coming from soil. And that comes from that short cycle. So that's your trampled material. That's uh, a dead calf. It's <laughs> all sorts of materials that's breaking down 
and releasing that carbon to the plant. Right? But the important bit of this is actually that mycorrhizal pathway. So when you look at um, roots, you see that they're leaking. They're leaking sugars, they're leaking these hormonal signals, these proteins, and they're feeding biology all the time. And scientists have known this since about 1880. They were like, silly plants, what were you thinking? Leaking. All right, and it has only really been in the last couple of decades that they've figured out why they're leaking. So this picture here is of a conifer. So this type of mycorrhizae is ectomycorrhizae that I'm going to talk about. This is not the stuff that we're looking at in pastures. If you want to dig up some aspen or cottonwoods, you'll see these visible uh, fungal hyphae. So in grasses, this is invisible. But this is what a plant looks like without mycorrhizae. Hold on to your hats. This is what it looks like with mycorrhizae. So what happens is that plant sends a hormonal signal to connect with the mycorrhizae, and it basically sends out an order, because it's wanting phosphorus, for instance. So it's going to send out carbon and carbon, and say, this is the currency, I feel like pizza tonight. Anyone want pizza? And it will send out that carbon and bring back the pizza de delivery guy. Or it's going to bring in phosphorus or zinc or water. But this is key to resilience. And what I'm seeing on a lot of ranches is you have very, very low mycorrhizal colonization. And you want to figure out why. Because the system's not going to work optimally until you get the system working. Carbon. So this would be one visible way we might see that, would be what we call these Rastafarian roots, man. So they should look like great big dreadlocks. When you look at your root systems, you shouldn't actually be able to see roots in there. So what I might do is, have I got a plant in the room? Anyone like to be a plant? Plants, come on up. All right. Anyone feel like they want to be roots? So um, yeah, I'll get some roots up here. Very good. I I've, got, I've got your sugar up here. So, if we have, thank you. So if we have uh, the plant here, lovely plants, oh wow, cool. So, I'm gonna get you guys to hold that end. All these volunteers, come along here. This is the plant root. So, every day the plant, whose name is? Ben. Ben, cool. What's he doing? He's bringing in what into his body? Is he bringing in sugar? Sunlight with CO2 and water is very helpful. And he's making what? Carbohydrates. So carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Basically the building blocks for everything. Right? So everything in you, everything in your plant, and your cattle started as sugar. So he's got sugar here, and it's uh, Halloween, obviously. <laughs> uh, so you're going to send sugar down the root zone. So the plant's doing this constantly. So up to 30% of its sugars, it's sending down the root zone. When it gets down here, you can just drop it. Cool. Keep going. It's always leaking. We've got some bacteria in the house. I've got two bacteria. Quickly, these sugars are just, oh, I might have to eat one. All right. So we've got sugars that are being exuded. The bacteria, yeah, go, go, get them, get them. So the bacteria are going to take that up. What they're also going to do is they take up nutrients. Mmm, those are good chocolates. All right. So they're going to take up nitrogen, and they solubilize phosphorus. I want you to imagine that the bacteria are like, you're hosting a party, it's the end of the night, you're tired, everyone else is leaving. These wise guys go and order pizza. You know, when will you go already? These are the guys that won't leave the party. No matter what you do, there's bacteria in the system. All over your hands, all over your body, all in your stomach, bacteria are always there. But one of the things they do is while they're solubilizing and take up nutrients, they don't release it. These are the constipated, sleepy soils that I was talking about. The nutrients are there. Sorry. <laughs> the nutrients are there, but they're not going to give it up until we get a protozoa in the house. Can I get a protozoa in the house? Whoa. Watch out. These guys are fast moving. 
<laughs> cool. And so she's going to eat. Ugh. Yeah, just like that. And you're going to take those nutrients. Keep passing sugar. Yeah. Yeah. And then because she ends up with an excess of phosphorus and nitrogen in her body, you're going to do what? Poop it on the roots. So the roots get pooped on. Up come the nutrients to the plant. What are you going to do with that? You're going to... You're going to grow. You can just, you can grow. All right. So the plant's going to grow. All right. Ooh, feedback. So then the, these bacteria still take up nutrients. Then we're going to get a good nematode. Can I get a good nematode? So these good nematodes are brilliant at defending the root zone. They're going to eat these bacteria. <laughs> And they're going to take up these nutrients. Awesome. But instead of pooping, what are you going to do with those nutrients? Ugh, gross. So those nematodes are going to vomit their nutrients up to the plant. What's the plant going to do? Grow. grow. You could grow. Yay. He didn't want to do the sound effect. <laughs> grow. OK. Can I get a bad nematode in the house? Because you always find these guys all lurking around. Can I get a boo? Ooh. All right, I better get out of the way. So we've seen this under electron microscopes. Is if this bad nematode tries to come in the scene, good nematode, you're going to do what? Whoa! <laughs> so violent. So what we see is they don't kill the bad nematode. Get off the stage, man! Just get down. Yeah. They won't kill him. They're going to keep him away from that root zone because good nematode doesn't want his sugar daddy being interrupted, right? He just wants the system to keep functioning. Very good. Who else are we missing from this system? The fun guys. So can I get two fun guys? Fun girls? So these fun guys... Oh, I stood on the chocolate. All right. So these fun guys live in and on the roots. Yeah, I just need two. Sorry, mate. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. We can give you chocolate, though, if we're good at it. So if you can go that way, Michael Rizzi, see ya. Woo! Don't garrot anybody. We talked about this. <laughs> health and safety, health and safety. All right, if you see this, yep, go to the right, go to the right. Okay, if, whoa. All right, if this lands on your head, just grab it. What do you find? What's out there? You don't know. <laughs> to the right, go to the right. Yeah. Is there a letter P out there that someone's moved? Is there a letter P? There's a letter P. Can someone hold up the P? I've got a P. You've got a P. <laughs> Pretend P coming your way. Awesome. Hold that. Oh, wow. There's lots of sugar in here. <laughs> Very good. So the, the mycorrhizae takes the sugar. Here you go. Run with it, girlfriend. Uh, go nip down that aisle. Oh, oh, ah. It's like electric fence reel. Oh my god. Wow, what do you find? Water! Oh my goodness. All right, what are you gonna do with that sugar? Just throw it. Just yes, very good. That was very mean. Oh, one person got it. Very good. Okay. So this is one of the main ways that plants actually access water. Okay, so hold that into that system so it's all connected like this. So this ecosystem is very diverse. This plant is signaling all the time. You've just been attacked by an insect. There's a type of biology that's going to help it respond to that. What do we do to, to damage this system? Yeah, so we could use some kind of chemical aside. Gone. What else can we do? Tillage. Gone, all right. What else could we do? Yeah, so we could use superphosphate. Goodbye, nematode. Jump. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and we could do things like overgraze. See ya. All right. So then this would be what a typical system would be if there'd been a lot of disturbance. Water logging, for instance. So we've still got bacteria in the system. The nutrients are in their bodies. They're immobilized. So uh, what is a farmer now going to have to do to get nitrogen and phosphorus? 
They're going to have to add some fertilizer. What are they going to do about water? They could irrigate or they could go, can someone give me some money because I'm in a big drought, All right? Drought. What are you going to do, buddy? Oh. Da -da 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 All right. So you're going to eat that root. Go, buddy, go. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, and then, oh, very sad, very good. So this is actually where we're at with a lot of our conventional <laughs> models is we're now having to prop them up artificially. You're now going to need pesticides, you're going to need fungicides, you're going to need fertilizer or irrigation. Thank you guys, you've been really great. That was awesome. Just throw them to the crowd. Hopefully everybody got some candy. So this is the process that we've been talking about is you're not cattle producers, I'm sorry, you're not farming cattle. Your job is how do I capture as much sunlight energy as possible. Just because you have a living green plant doesn't mean that it's photosynthesizing optimally. So one way that you can actually measure that is to use a refractometer. So who's got a refractometer? Who's actually taken it out of the box and is using it? <laughs> yeah, about half, very good. Get it out of the box, man. All right. So the function of plants is to capture that sugar, which then turns into everything. Cellulose, lignin, protein, it all begins as sugars for the building blocks of life. And it's what ends up being profitable. This is your big ka moment, is how do we build sugar in the system? So we measure it looking through a refractometer. You want to see it at least above 12 for grass and above 16 in alfalfa. Right? So it's a measurement of dissolved solids and the amount of sugars in there. They're really cheap instruments. You could get them on Amazon for like $30. Like, there's no excuse not to have one of these. It takes you about 40 seconds to take a reading. So who gets that sugar? I love that picture. This is a fluorid. What animals can you see in that picture? It's very blurry. Cattle, deer, and sheep. This was about a, a, a year-long experiment in which the farmer doesn't do it anymore. Okay, just I say no more. All right, so who's going to get that sugar? So that plant's going to either give 50% to the roots and shoots and nothing to the microbes if that plant is missing trace elements or it's stressed, or it could be sending as much as 40% of those vital sugars out to the microbiology. So these root exudates are what that we then call the rhizosheath or those Rastafarian roots. So it's made up of things like mucilage, your root exudates, fats, waxes, carbon, sugar, hormones, acid, and these things called secondary metabolites. So things that the plant will use for defense and attract different types of insects. Do your root systems look like that? Hand up. Right, when I come back next time, I want to see everybody's hands up. Okay. You want to see root systems like that. When this particular farmer, this is a dairy farm, but when he started this, his soil was only in that top one and a half inches. See where it's sort of a darker line? That's about as much topsoil as he had and as far as his roots would go. So he looked at how do I stimulate microbiology? How do I get my rooting system down? Because if you're only an inch, if your roots are only an inch deep, you're only an inch from a drought. Yeah. So you want to start digging holes and look at what are my roots looking like, how deep are they going? So essential for your plant protection, nutrient uptake, plant growth, it's what is feeding your microbes, building carbon and resilience. In that rhizosheath, that pH can be buffered by as much as two units. So you might have a pH of eight, but the plant's actually experiencing six and a half. Or you could have a pH of five, that plant is experiencing seven. It gives it a buffer to say, um, hi, I'm going to practice this, aluminum. <sighs> so if you've got aluminum issues, if you have um, acidity issues, that plant with that rhizosheath can buffer it. So you want to see root systems like this, that you can't see the actual root material. Visibly, so this is easy to see in sand soil, so you can see how those, that's that leaking color. What's the color? There's, there's your carbon, right? There's your exudates. 
So even on sandy soil, so these plants are just starting to germinate. Look at that rhizosheath. In this particular environment, they've got real issues with sodicity. Those plants can grow now in sodic soils. We can, we can ameliorate those soils through stimulating and supporting that plant. I've got 10 minutes. Hmm, what to choose? <laughs> All right, if you have bacterial dominated soils, so bacteria are important, but what they make are the very fine micro aggregates. This is what leads to compaction. This is what leads to slaking. This is what leads to soil ending up in the, what's the river around here? the Rio Grande, all right? Or if you go and look at the Mississippi, all right? It's because of high bacterial soils, they just fall apart with high rainfall or wind, right? What you also see if it's high bacterial and you don't have the protozoa and the nematodes, it increases your nitrates in plants. So we'll see a nitrate response, and then you'll see those nitrate weeds. So those nitrate weeds might be foxtail barley grass. They might be uh, nettles, they might be thistles. So you know people will go, it's a good thistle year? No, you've got bacterial dominated soils and you've got a boost and a burst of this release of nitrates. Bacterial dominated soils. So who makes it rain? It's not cats and dogs, <laughs> just to let you in on that. It's actually bacteria. So 40 to 100% of ice crystals up in clouds contain certain types of microbiology that can actually make ice freeze at warmer temperatures. One particular organism is called Pseudomonas syringae. They make ice nucleating, um, bac ice nucleating bacteria. They are what cause frost damage, right? So it's a type of bacteria, it falls from the sky. But there's ways that we can actually reduce those frost factors. So by reducing the free nitrates, so that's getting this whole ecosystem starting to work. By lifting our bricks, so supporting plant health and improving bacterial activity so the soils get warmer, we can reduce the amount of frost. But there's also organisms that eat those frost-forming bacteria. One of them is called Pseudomonas florensins. It can protect from frost damage down to, oh, sorry, minus six centigrade. I don't know what that is in your language, sorry. Okay, <laughs> for as much as two months. Now, what's really interesting is what comes out of a worm's butt is the elixir of life. And one of the organisms it contains is this Pseudomonas florensins. It actually helps to reduce frost damage on leaf surfaces by having worm extracts out there. So we'll see this sometimes, this is areas that have been treated and areas that are non-treated. You can see how the frost will settle. Start to look for this at your place. Although you probably don't go frost, you probably just go snow. Can't help you with that, anyway. <laughs> so fungi are really important because they're part of disease suppression. They are holding on to and releasing nutrients to the plant. And they're what forming the soil macro aggregates, all right? So the large aggregates in soil. One of the interesting things is they can, they, they can actually mine rocks. So you can get a soil test, it'll tell you you've hardly got any phosphate. But yet when you do a plant tissue test, you've got loads of phosphate. These fungi are working away at mining at rocks. They also are making rocks. And what's cool about this is they're, they're making these rock type formations and they're sequestering carbon in very, very stable forms. And this stuff is super new. Like, they're really only just looking at this now is the potential for fungi to be sequestering carbon into rock materials. So under a microscope, we can see that. This is calcium oxalate, so you'll actually see those are uh, fungal hyphae, and you see they look kind of grainy. That's the calcium on them. It's one of the main ways that we're getting calcium through into the plant in a biological form. What they form, and one of the things they form are these things called pectins. Okay, so the pectins is kind of the glue in between your cells and the plant leaf. Why should you care about pectins? This is all about metabolizable energy. This is part of what um, is gonna give you feed efficiency. And it improves your, the quality of your forage. So what we've been seeing is, um, have you ever heard of people will go into longer rotations and then they lose individual animal performance? So they've got longer rotations, taller grass, and they go, well, it's rank, and then you start to lose animal weight gains. Has anyone heard that? No? Yes. Hello. Anyway, I'm up here by myself. That's fine. All right, so what you'll see is the reason that that is rank is because you've got something called magnesium pectins instead. 
As you start to lift biological activity, the type of pectin changes. That is no longer rank grass. So this operation here, they're on a BRICS of 21. He's on tall grass grazing systems. He's making an additional $2,000 a week just through this type of grazing management. So just by stimulating fungi, he's actually lifting that calcium and changing uh, the quality of that taller grass. Okay? It's about stimulating biology. These fungi to bacteria ratios are really important. As we see that increase, we get more carbon accumulation. And there's, uh, is David Johnson here? No. I'm gonna be so excited when I meet him. Oh my God, All right. So like, he's like a rock star um, <laughs> at New Mexico State University who's looking at this role of fungi in terms of the relationship to production. So if you have a low fungi to bacteria ratio, this is where you're gonna see these low quality grasses. This is where you're gonna see um, just your blue grass or your cheat grass or your crested wheat species when you have a lower fungi to bacteria ratio. So like Deborah was talking this morning, as you start to build resilience, you'll see the type of species that then germinate is determined by the type of biology. What signal are you sending to your soil? Because that's gonna determine what species are growing above. Management is your number one tool, but it's not your only tool. And for some of you that have been doing um, good grazing management for like 30 years, you probably had a peak and then you've kind of plateaued. I invite you to consider there's another peak to keep going. And that's really looking at what's happening with microbiology. What is putting a drag on that system? Is it a trace element? Is it that you've just got used to being in another box and we're quite happy here and we're good? We're good, no, good. Or is it that actually there's another step we can keep taking? And this is where the biology come in so we can really start to push the boundaries of what's possible. So I thank you for your time. I think that's my time, isn't it? Uh, this has been a real honor for me to be here. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Have we got, have we got any time for questions? Um, I think we have time for two questions. Ooh, two questions. Two. I'm really pushing it here. All right. Um, not necessarily. So we're going to look at what is the drag on your system, and it could be it could be chemistry, right? So. What we'll be doing is a plant tissue test because the plant's going to tell you, are these nutrients in your soil but not functional? So if you're getting them, uh, they could be high in the soil and they're not in the plant, that's probably a biological issue. So you want to, I recommend people do a, a soil food web test or a soil microbiology test, a soil mineral test and a plant tissue test so we can start to collect that whole picture. And obviously your visual stuff. Why is it that you haven't got growth? Maybe you've been waterlogged or overgrazed. But yeah, that'd be a good place to start. Okay, one more question. Uh, I saw that. <laughs> oh. So how do we combine the grazing and the biology? That's a good question. So um, I've been working here in the US since 2013 and I never thought that would see the day when people would start to put things on rangeland. And last year we saw you know, a couple tens of thousands of acres having biostimulants being applied to rangeland. So we're doing that either as a slurry or we're putting them out in aircraft as extracts. Um, and we're putting on small amounts of things. So we're just putting tiny amounts on to provide the catalyst that that soil might need. So one of the things that's really important for, for plant health um, to feed microbiology is what opens the pump to pump the sugars out the roots is boron. And a lot of you guys are low in boron, and until you address that boron issue, that plant can never get that pump working. So we might just be putting tiny amounts of boron on, and we're spraying that onto rangeland. Now, considering how long we've been, you know, ranching that land, and it's never had anything put back on it, and a lot extracted off it when you look at what soils probably look like before your forefathers arrived, being able to put something on has been pretty exciting. So, yeah.
Cool. Thank you. Uh, Nicole will be around. Uh, you can find her there for questions, and she will also be our keynote, one of our keynote speakers tomorrow night, so she'll be available for other questions then. I'm sorry to cut off the questions, but uh, we need to get this room ready for lunch, so I'm going to ask you to bear with me for about one minute of really fast announcements, and then I'm going to have you get out of here as fast as possible. Um, so again, the lunch procedure for this room is please take all your belongings with you. You're going to leave the room until noon. At noon, there will be silverware outside the main doors. If you can pick some up and come in and have a seat, you have to be in a seat for the hotel staff to bring food to you. So please do that quickly at noon. Um, again, visit the bookstore, visit our exhibitors, um, fill out your acreage survey, Sign up for roundtables. Those sign-ups are actually out now. I apologize that they were not out before. And I, I really want to say one thing. I know you all are getting up and being really good about getting out of here. But I want to say thank you to our sponsors. This event, big round of applause for our sponsors. This event has a huge amount of support, and everybody, we are able to give a much better rate to have everybody come here because of the support from those sponsors. So please, if you see somebody with a sponsor name badge, tell them thank you. Um, all right, now's the moment.